Good morning, fellow malefactors and co-conspirators. Uh, I am Ed Wasserman, Dean of the Graduate School of Journalism. Uh, it is my honor to welcome you now to the 11th annual Reeve and David Logan Symposium of Investigative Reporting. Uh, I've been asked to open with some introductory remarks, uh, and uh, that too is a pleasure. Um, a year ago, when we met, we had an administration in Washington that made a lot of bold noises about the media, especially about open government, press freedom, and we worried that they did not keep their promises. Now we have an administration that also makes a lot of bold noises about the media, but now we worry that it will keep its promises. Promises like making libel suits easier, inciting boycotts of advertisers who support coverage critical of the administration, executing Edward Snowden as a traitor, cracking down on anonymous sources. They shouldn't be allowed to use sources unless they use somebody's name, the president said. And of course, declaring the media enemies of the people. So the world of news has been transformed into an ideological battleground with a political leadership that regards the whole idea of independent fact-finding and verification as something to sneer at, and where the simple process of reporting realities and identifying falsehoods has become a powerful and nearly subversive act. Since that's what the people in this room do, I invite you to look around take some satisfaction in yourselves. You routinely move the needle on critical stories, game-changing stories, and people are the better for it. This conference is only partly a conference, as I noted a little bit earlier. It's only partly a chance to learn more trade craft and exchange story ideas and network. It's also a celebration. It's a celebration of what you do. For this and the, next, and the model you set for our students, the next generation of muckrakers, I salute you. I want to tell you, though, that Donald is only part of the problems that we face. Journalism in the public interest, first and foremost, needs access to the public. That's why the ongoing industrial transformation of the news business is a greater threat to its future, in my view, than anything coming out of a petulant White House. At issue is a fundamental change in control over the news media themselves. We say content is king, but what media history tells us isn't that at all. Content doesn't call the shots, it's control over the channels through which content reaches audiences. You can start with the studio system in Hollywood, which was started by people who owned theaters and wanted something to put, wanted something to draw people into the theaters and fill the seats. So the radio industry was started by radio manufacturers. They had needed content. They wanted to fill the airwaves so that people would fill their living rooms with radios, and so forth. It's now, it's the social media platforms that are the ringmasters of the vast online circus. Now, this is the subject of an illuminating study I want to salute by the Tao Center at Columbia, my second favorite graduate school of journalism. <laughs> now, this arrangement poses huge problems for the future of high-end investigative journalism. It rests on the pauperization of the news business. The ad revenues stay with the platforms, not the publishers. It rewards scale. Audience size is the unique criterion of success. Favors the sensational over the significant. Favors the sensational even over the factual. Why do we have fake news? Because fake news pays. It's built on audience surveillance and measurement. And it empowers countries, I beg, I beg your pardon, it empowers companies that are themselves conglomerates, tightly interlocked into sectors dependent on government favors and collaboration with other industrial giants. My predecessor as dean here, Ben Bagdikian, author of The Media Monopoly, is stirring in his fresh grave. Hence, we see huge potential sources of corruption, new and old. So it's tempting to indulge in despair, but don't. We've been here for a long time. The greats of journalism, from Ida Tarbell to I.F. Stone, always struggled with economic pressures favoring sensational trivia, always fought uphill to do serious, complex work, long had to contend with what Upton Sinclair in 1919 called the brass check of corporate power. And a major difference now is that with those bad things come enormous new good things, 
The reach and capacity of these new channels confer unparalleled advantages on e all of us. And we have such, such innovations as video on demand, which you'll be hearing more about later on, which again open up new channels, new powerful channels to reach audiences. That story on Facebook even taps on the front windows of nearly 1.9 billion active users a month. So we don't just have unprecedented possibilities of vast public disinformation, but of vast public illumination. And that's what gives me, somebody who got his first reporting job in 1972, tremendous confidence. So I leave you with a thought that the continuing vitality of the work of all of the people here today testifies to a future that is, for all the obstacles, political and commercial, extremely bright. It is now my great honor to present to you someone who is about to take on daunting challenges of her own. In many respects, the problems of public higher ed are eerily parallel to the challenges we face in the news media. Both confront economic models that have been upended and a public whose affection can't be taken for granted. It's a challenge to leadership and it's a pleasure to have with us this morning UC Berkeley's next leader, Carol Christ, who is currently Berkeley's top academic officer and will be in her tenure as our 11th chancellor in July. Carol began as a highly regarded scholar of Victorian literature, whose career at Berkeley started in 1970 when she was a freshly admitted PhD from Yale. She interrupted her time here as academic and top administrator to serve as president of Smith College, one of the country's most distinguished liberal arts colleges for 11 years. She has a reputation as a champion of women's issues and diversity, has stepped into a turbulent and demanding job. We're honored that on this lovely Saturday morning, she's accepted the invitation to join us here Ladies and gentlemen, Carol Christ. Good morning. Uh, welcome to Berkeley, the home of free speech, um, despite Anna Coulter's uh, protestations. Um, this morning when I was thinking about what I wanted to say to you to introduce this conference, I was wandering around the web and I found a page of Thomas Jefferson's statements about freedom of the press. I didn't know that Thomas Jefferson had written as extensively as he did on freedom of the press. Indeed, he said, were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Um, the most interesting um, passage that I've found is the following. This is, uh, really suggests to me um, the way in which the freedom of the press figured in Thomas Jefferson's early thinking about both democracy and about the experiment of the republic. He wrote in a letter to T John Tyler, no experiment can be more interesting than that we are now trying and which we trust will end in establishing the fact that man may be governed by reason and truth. That's a really sobering statement, I think, in our current circumstances and one which leads you to wonder whether man indeed can be governed by reason and truth. To continue with Jefferson, our object should therefore be to leave open to him all the avenues to truth. The most effectual hitherto found is freedom of the press. It is therefore the first shut up by those who fear investigation of their actions. Very much in the spirit of the title of this, of this conference. Um, Indeed, Jefferson was very aware of um, the ways in which what he called despots um, tried to use the press to their advantage. He felt that despots um, hired, he wrote that despots hired standing armies of news writers who, without regard to the truth, invent what will serve to the government, what will serve the government, in other words, alternative facts. He felt that the art of printing changed the world. And here, now, of course, we don't just have printing. We have radio. We have television. We have the web. But indeed, it's the mass um, uh, reproduction of words that, in Jefferson's um, view, changed the world, making available to the entire people um, thought 
fact and opinion. Jefferson had a John Stuart Mill-like confidence that in the free marketplace of ideas, the truth would prevail. Or um, to use the words of another great thinker, that the free press was important in what Martin Luther King called the moral arc of the universe bending toward justice. That's why the work of the Center for Investigative Reporting is so important, and I'm so proud that it is here at Berkeley. I'm excited to announce that the University of California, Berkeley has entered into a formal affiliation agreement with a new nonprofit company that will adapt and produce the important work of the investigative reporting program and its partners for broadcast and online audiences around the world. This partnership with investigative reporting productions is the first of its kind for our university and will it serve to extend Berkeley's public mission to one that reaches indeed around the world, um, reaching the public with information and insights that are critical for our democracy. It also will provide an important source of income for the School of Journalism, which is important as well. Um, I'm now pleased to turn the podium over and int introduce Lowell Bergman. Lowell is the um, Reva and David Logan Distinguished Chair in Investigative Journalism at the School of Journalism. He's been teaching a seminar for over 20 years in investigative reporting. Um, earlier in his career, he well, worked for Ramparts Magazine, for Rolling Stone, for ABC, uh, for the New York Times, for PBS. He has won many, many awards, a Pulitzer, uh, numerous Emmys, the Alfred I. DuPont Columbia University, actually six Golden Baton Awards, three Peabody's, a Polk Award, a Sidney Hillman Award for <laughs> Labor Reporting, the Bark Richards Award for Media Criticism. <laughs> I'm going to keep going, though. <laughs> anyway, we're honored to have him on our faculty. <laughs> I have nothing more to say. <laughs> uh, good morning. I, I guess the most important announcement is that our t-shirts have sold out. <laughs> but you can order them online, I'm told, or will be able to soon. Um, so I just wanted to welcome, in, in particular, because we have journalists from around the world, from Mexico, from Peru, from Japan, from the UK, and yes, from Russia here today. And we have three winners of the 2017 Pulitzer Prizes. One was part of the team of the East Bay Times that won for breaking news over the ghost ship fire, Tom Peel. Tom, where are you? Oh, there he is, okay. Which, which by the way, in the world of uh, journalism prizes, particularly like the Pulitzer, for a small newspaper, way on the left side of the country, to win for breaking news is quite an achievement. Um, and we also have here today the winner of the, public, uh, the Pulitzer Prize for Public Service, the editor-in-chief of ProPublica, Steve Engelberg. Austin in the mix. And then David Fahrenthold was here yesterday, uh, he had to he had to go back to Washington to uh, accept an award at the White House Correspondence Dinner, and you know his, his reporting was on the Trump Foundation, and, it's, and, it's, and it's, um, it appears to be the reason why the president is not attending the dinner tonight. Uh, but his editor, Steve Ginsburg, is here, right here, and who, is, who as I understand it, has managed the, the, the Post's really, I think, uh, incredible coverage of of both the election and the president. Um, so welcome to all of you. Um, and then also in the audience are a wide variety of people, including some of our former confidential sources like Jeff Wigand, I think is here, uh, who was played by Russell Crowe. He's down here in The Insider. And there's a variety of, you don't have to identify yourselves, law enforcement, um, defense lawyers, private investigators, congressional investigators, bankers, philanthropists, hedge fund managers, 
and the usual uh, likely suspects. And this year, I think for the first time, well, actually not the first time, the second time, uh, representatives of VODs, I learned about VODs over the last year, the uh, video on demand companies. More about them in a minute. And, um, uh, and of course, Chancellor-designate Carol Christ, who, in, who introduced the fact that uh, we have created this company with the university, um, this formerly affiliated company, and uh, it is a nonprofit, but it also can engage in profit-making ventures. And your organization, or you yourselves, may want to contact us uh, because we'll be able to help you produce and distribute your work through this entity. Um, and we now, for the first time, will have the opportunity to think, I hope, on a regular basis to reach a much wider worldwide audience and have much more control over what we do produce. Um, this, and as part of that, we have signed our first commercial deal once the company was formed with Amazon Prime Video. And Yuri Fleming, an executive of Amazon, is here today uh, to not only observe our, our proceedings, but also to review our work. Yuri, where are you? Mm -hmm. okay. Um, okay. And then a really important announcement. Since you were here last, we've had our first full-time managing editor at the Investigative Reporting Program. He's joined the faculty at the Journalism School. He's become an uh, indispensable part of the team. As I was saying earlier this morning, he's brought uh, order to my anarchic chaos, um, which is usually my style. And in the coming year, he'll be taking over day-to-day -day management of the program so that I can help make this company a success and see if we can, in fact, uh, develop a new revenue stream to support investigative reporting. Um, and as part of that, and, and I want, it's not just that we've been doing commercial uh, deals, creating companies here in the last year. We've also been creating programs, and I just wanted to give you a brief sort of look at what we're up to. Those of you who know about our series on rape and sexual violence in the workplace, we have a sequel to it called Slaves Among Us, which is about labor trafficking, in particular of children, into the United States. We have a major project going on in Mexico called Los de Azul, about the Mexican police uh, with the World Justice Project, which is based in Washington. Uh, we have a nationwide investigation going on of the juvenile justice system called Defenseless. And with Common Sense Media across the Bay, another nonprofit and its leader, Jim Steyer, who's sitting here, unfortunately, in a Stanford t-shirt. Um, uh, can I do? Um, there, there are partners in this, and it's an unusual partnership for us, but it's a, a, in the sense that it's another nonprofit joining us in a, a nationwide investigation, which we hope to make into both video and print. And then we have a, an ongoing investigation that started initially with NBC News, and now looks like it will be potentially a series called Who Killed Lieutenant Van Dorn? It's about the death toll in the military, not from combat, but from training, from the use of defective military equipment that's regularly supplied to a serviceman, a subject area that literally almost no one is currently investigating, from what we can tell. And then we have a really interesting documentary that's being shot right now. It's called The Melting Edge. It's being done by one of our fellows and his partner. Uh, it's about the first place in America that's going to disappear because of climate change, probably before the end of the calendar year. Um, and then we have a, an ongoing investigation into bankruptcy and student loans, a plague that, uh, that affects so many of people who come here to Berkeley and go to the University of California in general. And a special international investigation that we're just launching with a number of partners into Russia and our president. Now, since the beginning of this program 12 years ago, all our projects have been based on the idea that we should be doing stories no one else is doing. 
and that we should integrate into that the grad students and alumni from the alums from the journalism school. Those major, pro those major works also involve, as many of you know, collaborations and usually are presented on multiple platforms. And in doing that, we were trying to also live up to the endowment that was created by the late patriarch and matriarch Mark of the Logan family, David and Reva Logan, who created the first chair in investigative reporting here at the Graduate School of Journalism and asked me to sit in it. And when David, in, who was really the, the, the leader in this effort, uh, did that, he said to me, you know, I want to shed light on the truth but he said, make sure you make a little trouble on the way. And I think we've lived up to that over the years and, and have been helped by John, Richard, and Daniel Logan, who I think Richard and, and John are both here, who continue to support us and are critical to our survival and to the expansion of the IRP over the last year. John and, and Richard. And of course, foundations like MacArthur, which has also been critical to this expansion, and Ford, which just recently joined us in expanding our uh, professional training involving uh, independent documentary filmmakers. What we're trying to do is develop a way in which we can help lift the standard of reporting in the, in the growing world of independent filmmaking. Um, and we've had our first series of seminars led by our indomitable Janice Huey, who made all of this possible. In fact, let's have a round of applause for, for Janice. Now, enemy of the people, we thought a lot about this. We're, we're, we're quoting Ibsen, by the way. Um, but we don't think the president was doing that. And, and we, we, we know that his inspiration for using that phrase wasn't exactly something that made us feel wanted. Or maybe it did make us wanted, or hunted is more likely. And, and it really is, as, uh, as Ed Wasserman pointed out, a big change from a year ago. A, big, a year ago when we were worried about the government hunting our sources or imprisoning Jim Risen to New York Times, now we have to worry about what are they gonna do next? Will there be some follow-up to this? Will they be, you know, this is the first president in the history of the United States who has sued the media for defamation. You'll hear about that some more in their first panel. This is the first president of the United States who continues to say things that before 1985, when there was regulation of the airwaves, you couldn't say. And if you said them, the networks would have to give you equal time to reply. There was such a thing as a fairness doctrine that has disappeared. This is a phenomenon we haven't seen before, and hopefully it's a phenomenon that won't get worse. A lot of that, I think, is going to be, a lot of our future will depend upon what we do in reply. But at the same time, as I pointed out a little bit earlier today, um, while we should be concerned, at least we're lucky. We're lucky we're not in Mexico, where the Committee to Protect Journalists brought attention 10 days ago to the fact that 50 reporters and journalists have been killed in the last seven years. So journalists' lives are on the line in other countries. Here in the United States, we still have protections. And let's hope that in the year to come, through the work we do, those protections get solidified. And I wanted to bring your attention not just to the death of Mexican journalists, but the, the passing of a journalist in the United Kingdom named Gavin McFadgen. You may remember him here at the symposium. He came to every one of the symposiums. Gavin was the kind of guy, an expatriate American living in London, who was always there when you got in trouble. He never ran from a battle. Unfortunately, uh, mid, in the middle of last year, 2016, he was diagnosed with lung cancer. And I went over to visit with him in London and it was Gavin, the indomitable Gavin, all over again. He sat in his place in London and for a period of three months uh, basically sat, uh, conducted a salon of people coming from all over the world, from stories he did for World in Action, the BBC broadcast, to stories he got involved in over the years, to the creation of the Center for Investigative Journalism in London. Gavin is going to be sorely missed. 
He was the guy you could count on when you got in trouble. And, should, and is an inspiration, I know, to many journalists in England and around the world. So his passing will be missed. Later today, uh, and as, as the dean pointed out, the issue of um, the distribution of our work uh, will come up. And we're going to revisit, with the help of our mystery guest, I know it's the first time we've ever had a mystery guest, uh, of our mystery guest, the history of keeping the airwaves open to the public interest. And, and that's going to be the subject of the last panel. But right now, I want to get to the, the issue of us being the enemy of the people and what that means and how it is that facts actually do matter. So I want to invite up Hari Srinivasan, the moderator, and the first panel. <laughs> 